Please be seated, everyone. Happy Friday, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It's been a long week. We appreciate your attention, your ongoing attention. Um, and we will resume hearing evidence this morning. Uh, Mr. Maybanks, the state may call its first witness. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Michael Peterson. Good morning, sir. You're headed over to this chair with the red seat. And before you take that seat, please pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and be seated. Mind the step. <coughs> and Mr. Peterson, anytime we're in the courtroom, there are a few rules that apply that are a little bit different to having a conversation outside the courtroom. Uh, I would ask you to just be aware of uh, the end of the, of the question, and please wait for the end of the question before you begin your answer. I'm going to ask both of the attorneys to give you the same courtesy uh, to allow you to finish your answer before they begin the next question. All right? Please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names for the record. My name is Michael Peterson. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you, sir. You may conduct your examination, uh, Mr. Maybanks. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Peterson. And uh, you see the microphone there? I think it's on now, so. We'll, yes. Yep, good, we can hear you great. Uh, my first question for you is how old are you? 72. Okay. And uh, do you work currently? Uh, no. So are you retired? I am. And what did you do for a living before you retired? I retired from the uh, Division of Criminal Investigation, and I had worked in the crime laboratory for that organization for 38 years. What positions did you uh, hold over the course of 38 years? Uh, when I was initially hired, I was hired to be a, a, a chemist, a drug, a drug chemist. And during my during my career, I I did that for a few years, um, as well as some uh, many other things. But ultimately, I was uh, assigned to what we called our microanalysis section, and that's where we dealt with the examination of dried body fluids. Was your uh, job title referred to as a criminalist while you were there? Uh, when I was first hired, I was hired as a chemist. And that title was changed to criminalist and uh, ultimately became my criminalist supervisor. You gave us a pretty good description there, but is there anything else that we should know about the description of the duties of a criminalist uh, while you worked at the DCI? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. When did you become a supervisor? I believe 1988. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, background before joining the laboratory? Yes. Um, I have a bachelor's degree with a major in chemistry. I completed one year of graduate work in chemistry. Um, at the end of that year, I was uh, drafted into the military, and I was assigned to the uh, United States Army Crime Laboratory in Vietnam. Uh, that was my fo first exposure to law enforcement-related science. And uh, upon discharge in 1972, I was employed by the Iowa Laboratory. And uh, that's where I finished, started and finished that, that career. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the background in the training that you received in the area of DNA forensics and or analysis. Maybe you can just kind of start with your first exposure to it and do your best to take us through the training that you received on that. We. We in the crime laboratory first became aware of the potential of DNA in the early 1980s, late 1970s perhaps. 
Um, the work was being done and reported by laboratories, usually outside of this country. There were foreign laboratories, but they were reporting their results, and uh, it looked like it was going to be very promising uh, in terms of the power of the of the technique. But at that time, it had uh, it had issues that it required large quantities of sample that we frequently did not have. Uh, the techniques were, uh, were, were grabbed onto by the uh, FBI and some other laboratories and developed and modified and improved to the point where they b did become, in about 1980, uh, 1987, something like that, they did become applicable for crime laboratory type work. And uh, the FBI then started training laboratory examiners across the country in the, in the methods and techniques that, the, that they had developed. Um, at, at, at a similar time, there was a new DNA method coming online called, or, or utilizing a procedure called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it was, in essence, totally different from what had been developed and was being developed at that point. But looking to the future, it appeared to be a far more useful technique for the crime laboratories. Uh, in our laboratory, we chose to wait until PCR methods were, were, were readily available uh, to bring DNA online, which, which we did in... Uh, in um, 19, late 1980s, with uh, with some commercial products that were that became available, based upon the PCR reaction, those rea those products were very useful and very sensitive and did amazing work on p on pieces of evidence that we looked at, but they did not provide. Um, the power of discrimination that we hoped DNA would provide, and the ability to tell the differences between individuals. Um, but uh, working in the background were new methods and new things that were being brought on all the time, and adding new new targets on the DNA molecule that provided more information. and. Uh, so we, we just incorporated them into our, our um, tools of analysis, as well as the FBI did as well, to the point where they established their, their database based upon uh, the PCR and, and a variety of, of, of targets that, that were looked at. Thanks for that rundown. Um, did you receive all of the uh, necessary training in the uh, PCR method once it uh, became available to your laboratory? Yes. Do you remember any, uh, specifically any trainings that you um, attended uh, um, of note? No, the first training that I attended was, uh, was at the FBI and that was in the, in the prior methods. Um, but many of the, uh, of the examination tools to prepare a sample for the prior methods were the same as what we use for the PCR methods. Um, PCR training took place for me uh, at, at a number of seminars, and uh, and the manufacturer of the products that we use also provided training within our laboratory as to uh, as to the application of their of their product. And eventually, through the course of this training, did you become proficient in being able to use the uh, methods that were taught to you in regards to the PCR method? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, and I want to take you to, um, well, first I'll ask you, uh, by the year 1997, uh, were you performing uh, DNA analysis for a variety of criminal investigations? Um, our laboratory was, um, I personally was involved in the supervision phases, so was not personally doing a lot of DNA work in 1997. Were there cases where you did uh, get involved in the uh, work? Yes. <clears throat> By 
by 1997, uh, were the analysis methods that your laboratory was using for DNA uh, generally accepted and used by other forensic DNA laboratories across the country? Yes, they were. Presuming that uh, throughout the course of your 38 years you have testified before in court about your analysis of DNA um, on items of evidence? Yes, I have. And have you made your, uh, your work available not only to prosecutors but to um, criminal defense attorneys and other agencies to review? My reports are available. The actual work that we do is generally at the request from the prosecution side. And uh, would those um, materials, to your knowledge, be turned over through the discovery process then? Yes. Okay. So in 1997 at the DCI laboratory, based on the timeline you gave us, you were working as a supervisor at that time? Yes. Um, but your testimony was that on occasion you would uh, also perform DNA al analysis of items submitted. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. While working as an analyst for the DCI laboratory in uh, approximately 1997, uh, based upon your review of the documentation in this case, uh, did you have an opportunity to receive some items of evidence that were submitted uh, in connection with a murder investigation in which the victim was Michelle Martinko? Yes. Uh, may I approach the exhibit, Your Honor? You may. And the witness, what's been previously marked as States Exhibit 17E. And um, Mr. Peterson, do you recall being shown that document? I think it was yesterday or maybe before yesterday. Um, in this case? Yes, I do. And is this a form that's uh, typically used for chain of custody purposes, chain of evidence purposes, when items are submitted to the laboratory? Um, yes, it is. And does this indicate then um, on or about the date on the top of uh, January 3rd of 1997 that several items were uh, submitted in this case? Yes, it does. And uh, does that include items, uh, uh, first marked item F? You see that? Yes. And what is item F described as in that document? Um, item F is described as a sealed package containing the victim's dress, pantyhose, and panties. And uh, on that same list are items G, H, I, J, and K. Do you see that? Correct. I want to direct your attention to item, item I. Can you describe what the laboratory received in regards to a description for item I? Um, item I was a sealed envelope containing blood from the shift selector. Does that indicate to you that uh, those items were submitted to the DCI crime lab through the normal chain of custody procedures? Yes, it does. Thank you. And uh, I want to ask you a question about some of the other markings on that um, exhibit. Yeah, you bring it up. It's going to come up. It's going to come behind you, Mr. Peterson, in a moment here. I want to, want to direct your attention to the top right um, where underneath uh, um, case assignment record, there's a number that begins with 8-5. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And uh, is, that, is that a number that's assigned by the DCI to uh, items that receive, they receive in connection with a, a case? Um, yes, it is. It's, it's a number that identifies the investigation that the DCI is involved in. Does the DCI assign their own case number to a case that's separate from the law enforcement department? Yes, it does. That's so you can track the items that are come into your laboratory? Yes. And does the 8-5 indicate the year when uh, DCI first started receiving items in connection with the investigation?
I, I think it would establish the year that the DCI first became involved in the case. It may not have received items then. Okay, that's thank you for clarifying that. Um, and um, can you tell us if we could scroll down a little bit here? We talked about items F and I and how they're designated. How how does the laboratory assign those letter designations as items come in? Well, the first item that comes in is assigned letter A, and each item after that is just incrementing through the alphabet. Once you get to item Z, then you double up, and you go to item AA, and then AB. And does this indicate then on the date of this, um, of this document then that, uh, as we mentioned before, the drafts and the blood were assigned um, designations F and I, respectively? Yes, it does. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Handing the witness what's been marked as a three-page document with State's Exhibit 9A on it. And I'll ask Mr. Peterson if you recognize this document. Yes, I do. What, what type of document is this, if you could describe the type of document? Uh, this is um, the actual report that was prepared that uh, that uh, relays the results of uh, the examinations that were performed to the submitting agency. And based upon your review of this document, was this report made at or near the time you conducted testing on items F and I, among others? Within, within the time limits that the laboratory was running in, in that time it does, uh, I initially started looking at samples in February of, of uh, 1997. This report is dated March of 1997. And um, just to help you with that and uh, allow for further explanation, can I approach witness again, Your Honor? You may. Okay, and the witness what's been marked as a two-page document uh, with the label of 17G on it. Mr. Peterson, you see that? Yes. And uh, can you tell us what that item is? Yes, this is a, a copy of the notes that I prepared while I was examining uh, items F in, uh, through K, the items that were on that first receipt form. And so do you recognize the handwriting on that document? Yes. Is that your, your handwriting? Yeah, this is what my handwriting used to look like. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's improved or got it worse? <laughs> it has uh, decayed greatly. Okay. All right. Um, what is the date of that document there? February 11th of uh, 1997. Yeah, does this contain the, the, the notes that you took in regards to the examination of um, items Exhibit F on page 1 and Exhibit I on page 2? Yes. Good. Does this indicate that you uh, began to conduct your examination of the items on February 11th of 1997? Yes, it does. And the previous uh, exhibit we saw, 17E, had January 3rd of 1997. Was that a um, fairly typical turnaround for when between when items were received and when you were able to examine them? Yes, that was, I, to my recollection, that was typical. And did the laboratory take measures to make sure that after items received, they were kept in a properly preserved condition uh, to protect the integrity of the items before you had a chance to examine them? Yes. Okay. Is this a record of notes you compiled then while you analyzed the items? Yes. And are these uh, records that are kept in the regular course of business at DCI? Yes. And obviously, um, 
does this indicate that those records are often retained at the DCI? Yes. Okay. I move to admit state 17G, Your Honor. Mr. Spies, do you have any objection to 17G? No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. 17G will be received and made part of the record. If you have room up there, Mr. Peters, you can just kind of keep it up there if you want for now. <clears throat> um, go back to 9A for a second. I think that's still in front of you. Thank you. Um, and I was asking you some questions about 9A. Uh, is 9A also a record that's kept in the regular course of business activity at the DCI? Yes, it is. And uh, after looking at 9A, is that a fair and accurate copy of your report that you compiled as a result of your examination that was sent to the uh, law enforcement department? Yes, it is. Move to admit, nine, move to admit 9A, Your Honor. Any objection, Mr. Spies? Uh, may I question the witness briefly, Your Honor? You may. Good morning, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson, does the Exhibit 9A contain the conclusions that you reached in your examination of the items uh, that were submitted to you in 1997? There are some, con what I would describe as conclusions included on Exhibit 9A. And, and maybe I was imprecise, but they also uh, uh, contain your findings from your scientific analysis of the exhibits that were submitted to you. Yes. You haven't yet told us how you reached those conclusions, have you? Excuse me? You haven't yet told us how you reached those conclusions. No. Okay. Uh, well, we object uh, at this time, Your Honor, to the admission of, of uh, Exhibit 9A until a sufficient foundation from the witness has been established showing uh, the basis for his conclusions and the manner in which he reached them. Okay. If you'd like to ask the witness a few more questions, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Your Honor. Um, does this uh, report 9A then contain an explanation of the findings that you um, uh, came to as a result of your analysis? Yes, it does. You can go ahead and keep that in, in front of you if you would. Um, you can put it down for now. If you, want. you have 17G in front of you, so if you need to uh, look at that, uh, let us know. But my next question is, can you tell us about um, the examination uh, of these items, starting with item F, as to um, how you conducted the examination of item F, to your recollection from those notes? Um. Item, item F was, uh, was, was a black dress. Um, the way I would have examined that was, uh, was to open it and remove it from its packaging, um, place it on, the, on my examination space. Uh, I took some notes as to, uh, primarily descriptive notes as to what it was, and uh, described briefly uh, in my notes about what sample I had taken. Um, item F, that dress, the dress was submitted to the laboratory with a request that it be the source of the victim's blood typing, grouping information. Uh, that we did not have a known sample from the victim at this time in 1997, and so the dried blood on this dress uh, would become that known. Um, for that reason, I selected an area that was close to one of the incisions on the, on the dress, one of the stab holes, and I, it was an area that was heavily saturated with blood. And once you selected that area for further examination, how did you conduct your examination? <coughs> um, well, <coughs> Portion of the D on the portion of the stain was uh, was the DNA was or DNA was extracted from a portion of the stain. Um, a brief assessment of how much DNA present in that extract was made. That's a, a step called quantitation. And then, based upon the quantitation results, a portion of the sample was taken for 
amplification in the PCR reaction. In 1997, uh, how was that uh, testing performed for the amplification? In 1997, we were using a, a, a commercial DNA product called Polymarker. It was a um, um, it was it was several DNA targets. The reagents necessary to target several DNA locations were included in one reaction mixture, so that we could. We could take a portion of the DNA we had isolated. We could mix it with the, with the polymarker product. We could perform the amplification and then examine the amplified results, and it would give us blood typing in several different DNA um, categories. After that process, were you able to read and interpret the results in order to put your findings into that report? Uh, yes. And does that uh, report then contain those findings from that process? It does. Move again to admits uh, 9A, Your Honor. Any objection, Mr. Spies? Just briefly, Your Honor, if I may. You may. Uh, Mr. Peterson, does uh, your report also contain your findings with respect to item I? It does. All right. And uh, you've not yet told us about how you obtain the uh, findings for item I, have you? Uh, no. What? Okay. Uh, Subject to that uh, objection, Your Honor, we would um, reserve our objection until it's been offered as re concerning item I. Go ahead, Mr. Maybanks. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And sorry about that, Mr. Peterson. Um, why don't you go ahead and um, then give us an idea of how you perform your testing on items uh, I as well. Um. Item I was a sample of, of a staining that was found on the gear shift lever. Uh, the sample was, uh, the staining was sampled by the submitting agency by using adhesive tape, so like fingerprint tape. I didn't actually see the gear shift lever. I saw the tape lift that. Um, the examination process was similar to that on the dress, other than that I didn't have the gear shift lever, I, just a portion of the stain that was uh, on the tape was, was uh, sampled, DNA isolated, and the same process applied to it that was uh, to everything else. And as a result of that? As a result of that process, then you were able to um, compile your uh, findings and conclusions in the report? Yes. Move again, Your Honor, to admit States 9A. Without objection. The court will receive States 9A and make it part of today's record. So what we're going to what we're going to do now then is uh, put um, the exhibit up on the TV behind you there, Mr. Peterson. Yes, 9A. So this is page one here, and uh, uh, with the uh, indicators that we've previously discussed in terms of laboratory case number, I don't think we've mentioned uh, here, but uh, this, was this report then completed on March 14th in 1997? Uh, yes, it was. Let's go to uh, laboratory designation of exhibits, column F, and uh, tell us uh, what you are summarizing there uh, in regards to <clears throat> item F there on this, this area of the report. Um, well, this portion of the report, in essence, merely says that I that I did the examination that was requested on item F, and and the results of that examination are included elsewhere on the report. Thank you. Yes, and if we could scroll down then to uh, where I is, H N I, it looks like. Um, <clears throat> Is the indication here um, 
where it says DNA isolated from the tape lift of the shift selector exhibit I was profiled as shown in the table. Does that summarize, um, again, your testimony that you gave today about how you perform that? Yes, it does. Right. Let's go down to the table now and um, look at the results here. Item F first, uh, again, described as a victim's dress. Can you tell us uh, what those uh, results uh, indicate? Um, yes. Okay. You need to use the pointer next to wow. you again here, too. Yeah. The, as I mentioned before, we used a commercial product for our polymerase chain reaction, the PCR reaction. The, the targeted sites on the DNA that the polymerase, that particular product, includes are these located up here. These are, these are shorthand names for them. LDLR stands for low density lipoprotein receptor. Uh, GYPA is glycophorin A. Um, in the DNA, arena when you see something like this, D7S8. The D means that it's a DNA uh, thing. Seven is which chromosome that it is on. And uh, S means that that's the only place it is found. S means single. And uh, eight is just a the numerical sequence in, at which that particular location was discovered. Um, DQ alpha and D1S80. Uh, D1S80 is actually a separate examination. It's not included in the commercial kit that we that we applied, but was another kit that we would that we would use. Um, now, on each of these loci, which is kind of the term used to describe them generally. Um, an individual will have the potential of two different kinds of DNA, one that they inherit from their mother, one they inherit from their father. Uh, many times they inherit the same kind from each parent, and in that case they are termed to be uh, homozygous. Uh, sometimes they inherit different kinds from the parent, and then they're called heterozygous. Uh, in this table, when you see only a single uh, description for the type, that would be a homozygous individual. They would actually have inherited, in this case, the glycophorin A factor from both their mother and their father. So the only thing we see is the A. In, on, this, on the same person on the LDR, at that locus, they inherited something from their mother, or something from one parent that was an A, and from the other parent, they inherited the B. Now, the kit is designed so that uh, all of the factors react with similar levels of intensity in, in, the, in the examination process. Excuse me, Your Honor, may we encourage the witness to use the microphone? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Spees. Does this work? Is that better? Better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on occasion, when we examine a sample, we see testing results that show two different um, factors that are present. But those factors are not expressed in the examination result in equal intensity. And that becomes an indication that the sample may be a mixture of DNA, that we have uh, one person, uh, each person's DNA is being expressed in the testing results, but because we have a, a mixture, they're not equally, not equally expressed. So, 
How did I get into this? <laughs> Is this kind of like going back to the Stone Age? Oh. <laughs> With DNA? Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. So at any rate, that's a, the victim's dress gave a nice, what I would describe as a nice, clean, single source profile, and I was able to determine types at each of the loci that were examined. Uh, the shift selector, item I, uh, if you would only look at the LDLR, LDLR loci, it would, it would look like it would, was, a, was a type AB, but the other loci show imbalances and uh, indicate that there's another blood sample mixed with that one, or another DNA source mixed with that, uh, with that sample. Uh, and then, so anyway. This is the tabulation of the examination results and provide the basis for any interpretation or conclusions that I may, may reach. I want to ask you a couple questions about some of your terminology here, which folks might, might know, but um, let me just bring the level down to a basic description here. Um, first, you know, how, what's your most kind of basic way to describe DNA? That's supposed to be an easy one. <laughs> well, most people think of DNA as being the blueprint for all of the life processes that go on in, in a living organization, uh, organism. Um, it provides the instructions to build the molecules that are necessary to sustain life. Many of us, when we think of DNA, we think of the double helix, right? Yes. <clears throat> and when we're picturing the double helix, uh, on the double helix, how would you describe where the, the loci are on that? Um, the areas that you're looking at to, find, to make these findings. I'm attempting to really to simplify this probably over uh, perhaps thinking of too much. Uh, if you were to take the DNA in a single cell and you were able to uncoil it and hang it in a long straight line, you would have a ribbon of material that is almost six feet long. Okay, that, that's hard, hard to imagine, but yet that's what happens in the cell. And it gets coiled and turned and packed and jammed together and gets included in the, in the, in the cell. That's six feet. Uh, contains approximately three billion base pairs. A base pair is like the double helix where you have the two strands. And where those two strands come together, that's, that's called a base pair. Um, in, the, in the coding system that DNA has, three base pairs defined an, an amino acid. So you can imagine that if you've got three billion base pairs, how many different amino acids may be defined in that, in that uh, chunk of DNA. The loci happen to be the pl place on that six foot where this particular amino acid is coded for. Uh, in, in this system up here, um, the amino acids that, that go together to form the protein groups, groups uh, GC, um, is one particular place in that DNA length is where that happens, and that's called the loci. <clears throat> and is that where you're targeting then to uh, analyze and reach your findings? Yes.
Okay, um, I think we have uh, another page or two, so let's just go to the second page here. So when the jury looks at that, they'll know what you're, uh, what you included. So uh, the explanation section, I think you've given us a pretty good idea of what you were doing there. Is there any other further elaboration that uh, you think would be necessary to help us interpret this? I don't, no, I don't think so. I, 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 I indicated, I indicated uh, on the testing results that one of the signs of a mixture was an imbalance in, 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 in two factors that may be present. Uh, this particular table does not describe that as being a basis for an admission, a mixture. Instead, it says that, uh, it says that the presence of more than two factors is indicative of mixture, and indeed it is. Um, but when you're examining typing systems that only have two factors, and then you don't see more than two. And that's what you were doing here, is only examining the two? Yes. Uh, anything else about this uh, explanation here? It looks like you referenced uh, uh, somebody else by the name of Fred Lewis. I guess we should probably talk about um, that and why Fred Lewis would be involved in this. And I'm, I'm not sure that I know the answer totally, but I believe that during the investigation of, of uh, this death, um, there were some similarities to another uh, case that had happened in, uh, in the state uh, that involved a Mr. Fred Lewis. Uh, even though it came from a different police agency, uh, the, our laboratory did have a sample from Mr. Lewis, and uh, we were asked to compare our typing results against his profile, and, uh, and we did do that. And this indicates that uh, he was, at least uh, during the, this analysis, uh, that no, there's no indication of his DNA being present. That's correct. Go ahead and go to the last page here, I think. What's this? Nope. Or do you want to show something else? No, no, that's okay. The last page is just a uh, a listing of the items that are that are referenced on the on the previous pages. Thank you. We can take this down then. And may I approach the witness again, Your Honor? You may. Handy witness, Mr. Marta, states exhibit 17H. Here, uh, Mr. Peterson. And uh, to the best of your ability, can you describe what we're looking at in State's Exhibit 17H? Um, yes. 17H is a copy of what, uh, within the laboratory, we referred to as the green card. It, the green card was a uh, inventory control system that was used by our evidence room. To uh, to uh, document and facilitate the location of items that were in the laboratory. <clears throat> and uh, does this uh, form contain um, indication of activity that uh, you were involved in in terms of the uh, aforementioned items uh, that um, you discussed and that are contained in your report? Uh, it does. Okay. Can you uh, tell us where on that document there's an indication of that? Uh, oh, we can put it up there, too, if you want. Well, actually, we haven't put it into evidence yet, so let me ask a few more questions. Um, is this a record that's kept in the regular course of business activity at DCI? Or was? It, it was. <laughs> right. Um, and is this something that, um, through the regular practice, was maintained, copied, and preserved? Yes. And... Um, You've indicated that, uh, that this contains, uh, your, does it have your initials on it? It does. And so you're aware, at least, of uh, your activity on this. And based upon what you see on this exhibit, does that contain other activity that was done in the regular course of business? Yes, it does. Okay, move to admit 17 um, H, Your Honor. Have you had an opportunity to review that proposed exhibit? I have, Your Honor. If I may, a question to witness briefly. You may. Uh, Mr. Peterson, uh, the uh, Exhibit 17H reflects activity occurring in 
2002, 2003, 2005. Do you have any personal knowledge about the activity that was conducted during those periods of time? I have some knowledge about activity that was conducted during that period of time, but uh, I was not involved in that activity. This uh, document, 17H, uh, purports to reflect when items were received by the Division of Criminal Investigations Laboratory and when they were apparently checked out, and you don't have any personal knowledge about that information, do you? No. By personal knowledge, do you mean was I involved in the check-in process? Yeah, it's not. No, I was not. It's not reflected in that. So, uh, on that basis, you ought to re uh, object to 17H on the lack of a foundation and authentication of this uh, document. Would you like to ask any additional questions of Mr. Peterson, Mr. Maybank? Oh, just maybe one or two. Um, Mr. Peterson, does this document contain uh, reference solely to items that are connected to, connected to um, the uh, case number 85-06117? Yes. And that's the uh, matter that you testified to here today? Yes. And um, again, does this uh, contain notations that, uh, based upon your um, tenure at the, the Division of Criminal Investigation um, are done in, in the regular course of business activity. Yes. That's all we have here. Okay. Any additional record, Mr. Spies? Same objection, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, over Mr. Burns' objection, the court will receive uh, State's Exhibit 17H. It will be made part of the record. Uh, can we publish that, Your Honor? You may. And we're going to scroll down just a little bit here. Um, and if you could give a, us and the jury an indication of your, your uh, activity, your initials uh, on this document. Yes. Uh, my initials are the MJP initials. Uh, they occur on, uh, let me d briefly describe the document at first. Okay. The, Thank you. the top half of the document is completed by the evidence room when evidence is submitted to the laboratory. The, the bottom half of the document is, com is, uh, is completed by examiners within the laboratory when they either check evidence into or check evidence out of the evidence room. So the top half would indicate, well, my first involvement was on, uh, well, it's 1987, I believe, and I checked out some uh, items A through D and uh, did some work on those. 1997 is when I checked out items F through K, uh, F being the dress and the gear, and in, including the gear shift samples and some other samples. And then I checked them back into the evidence room on March 30th, uh, February 11th in this case. These little notes on the side just say where the evidence is. Uh, down over here, it says that the evidence items F through K were returned by first class mail on October 10th of 97. And would that be returned to the law enforcement department, in this case, the Cedar Rapids Police Department? Yes. Just to, um, to note then, our, based upon procedure and protocol at the Division of Criminal Investigations, uh, was proper care taken to ensure the integrity of items when they were um, Place in the mail? Yes. Sealed, packaged, things like that? To, yes. Okay. And all efforts made to prevent any kind of uh, alteration, substitution, or tampering? Yes. Okay. One more question since we have this up here. On that top portion you referred to, 
Um, and we already have a document that has 1397 uh, indicating uh, when items were submitted. Um, on 11397, there's a signature for Den Dennis Murphy. Um, and then evidence tech, tech uh, yes, thank you, um, initials for items F and I. Does that indicate that that was the first time those items were received in the laboratory? Uh, yes, that's the way I would interpret it. Okay. Go ahead and take that down. Um, and your your honor, may I uh, briefly get out the I think it's seven A here. Mr. Peterson, um, if you don't mind coming down here for a second. This is a, a item 7A that's been previously described as the dress that Michelle was wearing on the night in question, the same dress reflected in the exhibits. Uh, towards the top um, area here, uh, <clears throat> sort of right top, there's an indication. Um, you see that? Yes. Okay. And um, when, you, when you conducted your analysis, do you remember what area the dress is that you looked at? Uh, Okay, sure. slightly left of the midline. There's also a marking here that has a Q9 on it. Uh, we had some testimony yesterday about uh, the dress being examined uh, by uh, another laboratory, the FBI laboratory. Is that, that, is that not a marking from the DCI? No. That, that's not one that I recognize. Does that indicate then um, that uh, another laboratory did uh, the examination of it? I mean, or it wasn't your lab? It could, I don't know. In, um, I know you probably don't have an exact memory of it, but um, any reason to believe, based upon looking at this now, that um, this dress has been uh, tampered, altered, or substituted in any way, based on your look of it, other than the other examinations done on it? Other than what looks like additional examinations, I don't think there's any changes to it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Just to clarify, uh, Mr. Pearson, um, when you talk about there being a mixture on the um, gear shift selector, based upon your findings and results and the standards uh, you were using in 1997, does that indicate the presence of another individual? Yes. 
Uh, nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Mr. Spies. Thank you. Good morning again, Mr. Peterson. Good morning. Mr. Peterson, uh, before we talk about the specifics of your uh, analysis and uh, findings in this case, you described for us in elegant fashion the uh, six feet of three billion pairs of uh, base pairs of, of the DNA structure. Do each of those three billion pairs represent a separate locus? Each of them. Uh, well, they could, but in fact they do not. The locus, the locus will be a grouping of base pairs that that code for something that we that we are aware of, something we know, and then where it where it is on that on the length of that chain. So, uh, asking you differently, how many loci <clears throat> are there in that chain? <laughs> well, there are potentially hundreds of thousands of loci. And uh, among those hundreds of thousands of loci, how many people do all of us sh share in common? We all have those loci. The, the individual details of what's coded for within the loci may vary among, and does vary among individuals, but we all have the, lo the loci. And does it vary at, for each individual at each individual loci? Uh, no. no. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, uh, targeting sites. Yes. And uh, tell me, or tell us again, how many targeted sites you identified or targeted in your analysis in these cases? Uh, if, if we include the D1S80 locus, which I examined on some samples, but not all of them, uh, that would be seven, seven sites were targeted. And um, maybe this is the same question asked differently, but how many potential targeted sites are there in DNA analysis? Uh, yeah. I, think, I think I said perhaps hundreds of thousands. Okay. So uh, each of those uh, <clears throat> loci are a potential target site in a DNA analysis. Um. Each of the loci are potential target sites. Um, not each of the loci would be useful to examine. I think I understand. So um, getting back uh, just briefly to your experience uh, at the DCI laboratory, when did the uh, Division of Criminal Investigations Criminalistics Laboratory become certified to do DNA testing? I, I don't remember those di th that date. Okay. Uh, the certification process is something that was developing about the same time that we were developing our DNA methods. And uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure certification took place after we had brought DNA online. In your examination of uh, the exhibits about which you testified, and specifically uh, exhibits F and I, I'd like to ask you just some questions about exhibit F first, okay? All right. Uh, you had before you there uh, exhibit 17G, which I think are your handwritten notes from February 11, 1997. Um. 
I, I have my handwritten notes. I, I don't think that I have the actual exhibit. No. Uh, 17G, is that two yes. uh, yellow handwritten pages? Yes, I have those. Back when your handwriting was much more elegant. <laughs> yes. So, uh, taking a look, uh, first of all, at, at Exhibit 7, excuse me, Exhibit F. Uh, after the, the letter F in 17G, there's a mark. Is that a colon? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Exhibit F is described in your notes and also <clears throat> in um, the other exhibits about which you've been questioned as including a dress, um, pantyhose, and panties. Is that combined Exhibit F? Yes. So we heard testimony uh, yesterday, Mr. Peterson, with that when these submit items were submitted <clears throat> to the laboratory, they were bundled or bunched together. Is that why it's considered one exhibit for purposes of your examination? Yes. Uh, but <clears throat> As I understand your testimony this morning, when you were looking at these exhibits, you only examined the dress. Correct. You didn't look at the, the pantyhose or the panties? No. Other than that, I, they were present. All right. <clears throat> and um, in, your, in your experience as an employee of the State Division of Criminal Investigation, you've also received training and the integrity of, of exhibits submitted for analysis by the lab, haven't you? Yes. And <clears throat> you've also been instructed and probably have taught on the dangers of contamination or cross-contamination of items of evidence that are bundled together. Yes, contamination is an issue that we are aware of. And <clears throat> these items uh, received by you in February of 1997, you don't have any knowledge about how those items were handled before they reached you, do you? None. That's, that's correct. You have to kind of rely on the integrity of the law enforcement agency or, or the investigator that they've taken steps to avoid contamination, alteration of the exhibits before you get them. Yes. Again, uh, uh, turning to Exhibit F, uh, or at least that portion of Exhibit F that you examine, the dress, in your notes uh, that you have before you, Exhibit 17G, in describing uh, the dress at the bottom of, of 17G, you say, um, all items show presence of white rabbit hair. Yes. I take it you didn't test the white rabbit hair for DNA? No. Okay. <clears throat> but it was distinctive enough that there was rabbit hair on the dress that you made note of it? Yes. In um, your further analysis of uh, Exhibit F, you um, spoke, I think, selected one site that you said was heavily saturated with blood. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And that was an easy, easy spot to, to, to check because it was an obvious place where it, <clears throat> there would be biologic material. Yes. In your examination of, of uh, the dress, uh, I know in past cases in which you and I have been familiar, <clears throat> you've made diagrams or drawings of some of the exhibits. Did you make any drawings in this case to, to show where on uh, 7A the dress you took that blood sample? No, I did not. Okay. But in any event, it was <clears throat> an obvious sight for you to test because it was saturated with blood. Yes. So next, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Peterson, let me, let me ask you a few questions about item I, this uh, lift tape that contained a stain from the ship selector. <clears throat> and during your testimony this morning, um, you <clears throat> first identified it as um, a blood source. And then I think you quickly corrected yourself to say it was another DNA source. Yes. And could you tell us uh, in your making that correction why you chose to say another DNA source? Um, 
well, the, the only thing that I can safely say, the only biological fluid that I feel confident in saying was present would be some blood crusts that were on the, on the tape lift or blood film. Um, there could be saliva or even uh, skin cells or something associated with that that I cannot identify, and they could be contributing their DNA to my testing results. So uh, stated differently, the, the mixture about which you testified uh, that you located on Exhibit I could have been a mixture from uh, body fluids other than blood. In addition to blood. Yes. Yes. We just don't know. Correct. Mr. Peterson, thank you. Those are all the questions I have for you. Redirect, Mr. Maybanks. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Peterson, um, based upon the description of the items contained in Exhibit F, um, did you have any concerns uh, looking at that in regards to any contamination? No. And to follow up on that, uh, is it out of, out of ordinary in your uh, custom or practice and procedure to see items, uh, for example, of clothing submitted from the same individual together? I, I can't speak to practice today, but when, when I was working, it was common for similar items to be packaged together. For instance, victim's clothing. That frequently would be received in one bag, unless, unless investigators, for some reason, had, had, uh, had a purpose in collecting them separately. And you said uh, just before they, uh, there was no concern for contamination. Is, is that your um, testimony then in regards to this case when this clothing from one person was submitted together? For my role of examining the DNA of a of that dress in an attempt to identify the profile of the victim, um, the potential of contamination was not uh, not a factor. I want to follow up on some of the questions about um, DNA that you were asked. Um, so you indicated that we, we as human beings, share, um, was it loci, um, uh, areas on the helix we share together? I think you said hundreds and thousands or something like that? Yes. OK. Um, that being the case, can you explain what it is about uh, these loci in the three billion or so pairs on the helix that makes us able to be differentiated from each other? I'll try. Um, the vast majority of that six feet of DNA that we get from ourselves, were we to examine that and compare it side by side, different people, we would find that it was the same. Now, those lengths of DNA that are all the same may include loci, may include things that code for proteins. But if they're all the same, it's not a useful loci for us to distinguish among individuals because, because we're all the same. Some loci, on the other hand, mm -hmm. show differences. Uh, a region that you may be familiar with is perhaps your blood group, your blood type. 
you may be familiar with what your blood type is. Some people are type A, some people are type B. That is controlled by a locus on DNA for blood type. Uh, that becomes useful to us because now we can tell people, we can differentiate people. So that's, that's, that's a locus that's of value to us, whereas many other loci may not be of value to us. Um, did that ex answer that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so in part, and as a good answer, is there, are there other areas then as well where we have the ability to be able to distinguish? Yeah. Yes, there are, there, are lots of, there are lots of areas. Um, in the forensic business, we started out with the ones that were on that table. They were, they were useful, but they, they weren't quite as useful as we would like. We would like to have improved, and we did do that. And now we're looking at a different, a different battery, a different combination of loci that, that, that we examine samples with. In terms of the areas where we um, can examine, where we can tell the differences between each other, how, how many possibilities do exist to, uh, in those areas to distinguish ourselves? I, I would just be merely, merely making a guess. I have, I have no idea. Um, does it fall in the, in the category of infinite? Um, no, I don't, I don't believe it would be infinite, but there would be lots. There would be several of them. There would be um, millions? No, there could be millions. Billions? No, I, I doubt that there's billions. So in terms of areas where you can find individual differences, we're talking in the, in the category of millions of different areas. Yes, I would think so. And do each of those areas potentially contain different information that distinguish us from each other? Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Additional cross-examination, Mr. Spies. Yes, briefly. <clears throat> um, Mr. Peterson, I, I had uh, understood you to say that if you were just Maybe I'm paraphrasing you inaccurately, but in response to a question from the government's counsel, you said that contamination was not a factor or would not be a factor in a situation where you're just looking for one, in this case, profile of the victim. Am I paraphrasing you accurately? I, I don't want to sound like I'm cavalier about the, the, the idea of contamination. Certainly contamination is something that's always considered and considered as a possibility. I would say that for my examination of this particular item, I have no indications of there being a contamination issue. You can't say that there wasn't, though, can no, you? No, I can't, can, can't say that there was not. And you would say, uh, as a matter of scientific integrity, Mr. Peterson, that if you're looking at mixtures of DNA, contamination is a very real problem, isn't it? Absol yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. Thank you. Additional redirect, Mr. Ray Banks. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. You're excused. And, counsel, can we make sure that Mr. Peterson didn't inadvertently take any exhibits? He did. I have one here. Okay. 
just want to make sure we, before he leaves the building, we've got everything we need. I think he had his own paperwork, so. Okay. Still here. We are, okay. Thank you, Mr. Maybanks. The state may call its next witness. State calls Dean Chapins. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Watch your step there. Before you take your seat, please pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and be seated. <coughs> Very good. That was one of the things I was going to ask you to do is be mindful of that microphone so that we, you can use that so we can all hear you. Uh, I am going to ask you to pay particular attention to allow the, the uh, lawyers to finish their questions before you begin your answer, and I've asked them to give you the same courtesy to make sure that you are finished speaking before they ask the next question. Yes, sir. All Honor. right. Uh, if you'd please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names for the record. Uh, I'm Dean Scheifus. My first name is D-E-A-N. Last name is C-H-I-A-F-O-S. Thank you. You may proceed with your examination, Mr. Maybanks. Thank you. First question is, how old are you, sir? I am 49. And what do you do for a living? I'm a police officer for the city of Cedar Rapids. How long have you been a police officer for the city of Cedar Rapids? 28 years. In the course of that 28 years, what positions have you held with the Cedar Rapids Police Department? Uh, I've worked patrol, traffic, detective bureau, narcotics. Uh, I think that's the main four that I've done. Where are you currently assigned? I'm currently assigned to day traffic. And you mentioned that you did some uh, investigations, is that right? That is correct. Uh, do you remember approximately what time period you were doing uh, investigative work? I was in the Detective Bureau from 1997 to roughly 2003, 2004. I can't remember which year. Okay. As a part of your uh, education, training, and experience as a police officer, were you uh, trained on the proper uh, handling uh, of items of uh, evidence? Yes, I am. And yeah, were you trained to ensure that items of evidence were, um, that the integrity of those items were preserved and that the items weren't altered, tampered, or substitute with when you were handling them? Yes. Do you have occasion, uh, based upon your review of documentation in this case, to have been in, com become involved in the um, delivery of items of evidence to the DCI laboratory? Yes, I did. May I approach witness, Your Honor? You may. Okay, the witness what's been marked as state's exhibit 17I uh, for identification purposes. Officer Chaipos, uh, can you take a look at that the exhibit for us? Yes. Is that something that you saw, that you've seen prior to today's day? Yes, it is. And is that an exhibit um, <clears throat> that, based upon your training experience with the Sea Rapids Police Department, is, is kept in the regular course of business activity, both with the department and the DCI lab? Yes, it is. Uh, is this an, a, a, an item that contains um, activity in regards to the case of the homicide of Michelle Martinko and the transport and delivery of items to the laboratory? Yes, it is. Uh, does this item contain your signature? It does. And was it, is it common practice for the Sea Rapids Police Department to keep these items? Yes, it is. Uh, move to admit states uh, 17I, Your Honor. Without yes. objection, Your Honor. 17I will be received and made part of the record. We'll go ahead and publish that if we could, Your Honor. You may. Thank you. While that's coming up, Officer uh, Chaifos, can you tell us, um, is this form uh, essentially a form that's used for what's referred to sometimes as chain of custody or chain of evidence? Yes, it is. And is that the role that you played um, basically in this case, is the chain of custody, delivery of evidence, those type of things? Yes, it is. All right. <clears throat> this uh, form, can you tell us what date, first of all, is indicated here? 
I believe it's uh, February 15th of 2002. And we see a, um, a case number beginning with 85. Is it your understanding that's the DCI case number? That is one of theirs, yes. Okay. Indication here about the offense involved being a homicide, Westdale Mall, those type of things. Do you see that? I do. Is it your understanding that's a summary of the um, pertinent facts for purposes of this uh, form uh, regarding the uh, at that time, cold case homicide of Michelle Martinko? Yes. And tracking down on the form a little bit uh, farther here, um, is that your signature then that appears in the left middle of the document? Yes. And then your printed name as well? Yes, it is. Uh, tracking down a little bit farther here now, even from that, uh, there's a description of uh, evidence in laboratory designation. Do you see that? Yep. And does that include items uh, Des designated by the laboratory as F and I, among others. Yes, it does. And indicated there uh, is some handwriting on it. Um, would you be able to tell us, um, to the best of your ability, what that says? For F first. Uh, for F, it would be resubmitted paper package. And what's the description of item F there? The description of the item submitted would be victim's dress, pantyhose, and panties. And under I, what does the uh, handwritten notes there say? Submitted sealed envelope. Is that um, submitted or resubmitted? Oh, uh, resubmitted, I'm sorry. That's I okay, thank that. you. And my question about that then is that indicate that these items had been previously submitted and are now being resubmitted? That is correct. Okay. And the description of item I then is indicated as what? Blood from the shift selector. The... Um, on that table there, there are uh, designations under agency designation. Do you see that? Yes. Are those, is that the designation that Cedar Rapids Police Department gave to these items? That would be my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, based upon uh, looking at this uh, document here, does this uh, indicate that on the aforementioned date um, that you delivered um, these items contained herein to the DCI lab for further analysis? Yes. And um, were you working on the Michelle Martinko case at that time? It was assigned to me as a cold case, yes. Okay. And do you remember the purpose of resubmitting these documents or these uh, exhibits? Excuse me. The main drive to it behind resubmitting them would be that some of the technologies in DNA had advanced significantly from the last time that they were tested, and we wanted to have them retested. Mm -hmm. And the last testimony we heard was it was originally submitted uh, to the DCI lab these items in 1997. So is it your testimony that in that five-year period there was belief among you and the other officers that um, there have been developments that could shed some more light? That's correct. Uh, while you uh, conducted this um, transport and delivery of these items, uh, did you utilize your training and experience to ensure that the integrity of the items were uh, preserved and there was no altering, tampering, or substitution that took place? Yes, I did. That's all I have for this witness, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Mr. Spies. Yes, if I may approach. Mm -hmm. You may. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, sir, I'd like to... Uh, uh, I hand you Defendant's Exhibit A-1 and uh, ask you to just acquaint yourself with that. Okay. Uh, we've had uh, testimony uh, from a couple of witnesses yesterday about Exhibit A-1. Do you recognize A-1? I recognize it as a evidence tag from the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Okay. And uh, you just told the men and women of the jury that in February of uh, 2002, you submitted... Uh, some items to the State Criminalistic Laboratory, including uh, what was designated by the laboratory's exhibits F and I, shown on uh, exhibit 17I, right? That is correct. And um, if you look at the bottom of uh, Defendant's Exhibit A1, there is a laboratory or a Cedar Rapids Police Department receipt from a Dean White identifying the presence in that package of panties, pantyhose, and a dress, right? Yes. And also on a, a Defendant's Exhibit A1 
shows that it was repackaged in December 31, 1996 by Officer Murphy, right? That is correct, too. Now, uh, um, just above Officer Murphy's repackage notation is a 215.02 state, and beneath that, the letters MM. Do you see those? I do. All right. You know who MM was, don't you? I would assume Michelle Marchenko. No. I, I think it's uh, Marsha Morton. Oh, that very well could be, yes. Okay. Marsha Morton is a, uh, was an evidence custodian at the DCI laboratory in Des Moines, right? Yes, she was. As a matter of fact, uh, Exhibit 17I, about which you just testified, showed that you turned over these items to Marsha Morton on February 15, 2002. Yes. So what I'm getting at here is when you submitted this package to uh, Marsha Morton at the DCI laboratory on February 15, 2002, you didn't unwrap that package, did you? I did not, no. And as a matter of fact, it had been repackaged in 96 and submitted to the laboratory on February 15, 2002 by you in the same package. Yes. So you didn't know anything about the integrity of the contents of that package, did you? I did not. I did not open it. Thank you. I have no other questions. Redirect Mr. Maybanks. Uh, briefly, Your Honor, I uh, may approach witness. You may. Any witness must have marked as 17J1, state's exhibit there. Um, Officer Trifos, do you uh, recognize that exhibit? I do. And <clears throat> do you recognize that exhibit as a, um, and a document that's also kept and maintained in the regular course of business activity with the Seattle Police Department? Yes, I do. And is that a document that originally produced uh, with knowledge of Cedar Rapids Police Department by the Department of uh, Division of Criminal Investigations for also for chain of custody purposes? Yes. Does this contain a, uh, a marking on uh, this exhibit uh, involving uh, your submission of items that you described here today, F and I? Yes, it does. And does that indicate then the same thing as the previous exhibit that the items were uh, submitted on that uh, February date in 2002? Yes, it does. Move to admit 17 J.I. Mr. Spees, have you had an opportunity to review proposed exhibit 17 J.I.? Yes, and we have, I'm sorry. Yes, and we have no objection. Okay. 17 J.I. will be received and made part of the record. And just one more question. Um, does that indicate that the items were received by Marsha Morton? Yes, it does. All right. uh, that's all I have. Additional cross-examination, Mr. Spees? None necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're excused, Officer Chakvas. Thank you. Uh, point of clarification, I believe it's 17J1. Uh, rather than I? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Okay, okay. <laughs> sorry. Just, we'll, we'll try to keep our record clean. Um, so the, the court will receive without objection State's Exhibit 17J1. Right. The statement call, it's, it, you know what, we'll take our morning recess. We'll be in recess for about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, folks, as always, I remind you again of that admonition. Don't make up your mind uh, or uh, discuss the case amongst yourselves. We will see you back here in about 15 minutes. Please rise for the jury. You can leave your notebooks on your chairs.